seventh grade. Welcome to week three. Um, I'm so impressed with what you accomplished in the first two weeks. You have done an awesome job at getting those assignments in and doing them really well. So keep up the good work in the third week. We are using the new um, format and platform of Google Classroom. And I know that's new to a lot of you. It's new to me as, as well. So there's gonna be some hiccups, some bumps in the road, some things you don't know. So make sure you're asking questions um, of all your teachers because we're all using it and we will be really good at using it by the time we get back to school. So this week we are reading um, King Arthur, the Sword and the Stone, and this retelling is by Hudson Talbot. Now this is a legend, so a lot of people have told this story throughout the years, and things change as it gets passed down. So when you read the story, you're going to hear new things um, and discover details that you didn't know, and it's a legend, so we don't really know if they're all true or not. The interesting thing is there is some background on page 792 at the bottom that you can read. Turns out that King Arthur was probably a real person, but just not as we know him in the story. The vocab for this week is also on page 792. It is turbulent, tournament, integrity, congregation, and I also added legend. So make sure you are familiarizing yourself with the words before you get into the story. Our story begins on page 794, and this video will be in three parts because it's such a long um, version of the story. So make sure you're looking at the videos in order or if you're following along with me as I read. And we'll get started. In ancient times, when Britain was still a wild and restless place, there lived a noble king named Uther. After many years of turmoil, Uther defeated the invading barbarians and drove them from the land. For this triumph, his fellow British lords proclaimed him their high king, or Pendragon, meaning dragon's head. Soon after his coronation, Uther Pendragon met and fell in love with the beautiful Lady Egrain, a widow whose husband Uther had killed in battle. Uther married Egrain and adopted her two young daughters, Margaise and Morgan Le Fay. The price for his love was a high one, however. In his passion, the king had asked for the help of his sorcerer Merlin in winning the hand of Lady Egrain. In return, Uther had agreed to give up their firstborn son. Merlin had foreseen great evil descending upon the king and felt that he alone could protect a young heir in the dangerous times ahead. Before long, a beautiful boy child was born, but the, surrounding, the joy surrounding the birth was brief for Merlin soon appeared to take the child away. But the child was just born, exclaimed Uther. How did you find out so quickly? Silently, the old sorcerer led the king to a balcony and pointed upward. There overhead was a great dragon formed by the stars. Its vast wings arched over the countryside and its tail swept north beyond the horizon. You see by the sign, my lord, that it is not I who calls for your son, but destiny. Sadly, the king gave up his son, for Merlin convinced him that the child's great future was threatened. Indeed, Uther Pendragon died within a year from, the tra from a traitor's poison, and Britain was, was once again plunged into darkness. After the death of the High King, the struggle for leadership tore Britain in pieces. The great alliance King Uther had for forged was shattered into dozens of quarreling, petty kingdoms, leaving no united force to oppose foreign invasions. Barbarians swept in once again and order gave way to chaos. Marauding knights roamed the countryside, taking what they wanted and burning the rest. No one was safe at home and travel was even more dangerous, with the outlaws ruling the roads. Fear was a constant companion of those who managed to stay alive. After 16 turbulent years, turbulent means wild or disorderly, the Archbishop of Canterbury summoned Merlin to help restore order. Although the two men were of different faiths, they had great respect for each other and shared much wisdom between them. I am at a loss, Sir Wizard, confined, confided the Archbishop. I don't know how to help the people, and they are suffering more each day. If only Uther Pendragon were here. I share your concerns, my lord, but I have good news, said Merlin. Although the end of King Uther's reign left us in the dark for many years, it is at last time for the sun to return to Britain. A brilliant sun, my lord, perhaps the brightest that Britain will ever know. But the sun was out this morning, sire, said the archbishop. What has the weather to do with this? I speak of the son of Uther Pendragon, and the true heir of royal blood who lives in a distant land and must now be summoned forth to keep his date with destiny. His date with who? asked the archbishop. But the king had no heirs. Alas, this is our problem. I wish to prove otherwise, my lord, replied Merlin. If I have your leave to use my magic, I shall create an event to bring forth this young heir and prove to the world that he is true and rightful high king of Britain. The delighted archbishop agreed immediately, and Merlin withdrew to devise his scheme. 
On a Sunday morning in the late November, the Great Cathedral of London was filled to capacity. As Mass was being said, a sudden murmur rippled through the crowds on the cathedral steps. Turning to see the cause of the commotion, the archbishop stopped in mid-prayer and walked toward the door. In the churchyard, he discovered a block of white marble with an anvil sitting on top. Driven into the anvil, gleaming in the pale winter sun, was a sword. Its blade was a flawless blue-white steel, and the hilt was of, was of highly wrought gold inlaid with rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. Engraved in the marble block were these words, Whoso pulleth out the sword from this stone and anvil is rightwise king born of England. We're on the top of page 796. Ah, so this is Merlin's plan, thought the archbishop, smiling to himself. A group of barons and knights suddenly pushed their way through the crowd, each stating loudly that he should be the first to try. A few managed to leap onto the stone and give the sword an unsuccessful yank before the archbishop stopped them. Order, order, he shouted, raising his hands to quiet the crowd. I hereby proclaim that on Christmas morning, one month from today, all those who consider themselves worthy of attempting to pull the sword from the stone and anvil will be given the opportunity. He who wins the sword thereby wins the kingdom. A mighty roar of approval rose from the crowd. Some even danced and stomped their feet. Noticing how pleased they were, the archbishop went further. And to celebrate this momentous occasion, a tournament shall be held on Christmas Eve. Um, tournament here is a series of contests. With this, the delighted parishioners swept the flustered archbishop onto their shoulders and carried him jubilantly around the stone several times before setting him down. They hadn't had such a cause for celebration in a long, long time. To all parts of the kingdom, messengers rushed out, carrying the archbishop's proclamation. Every castle and village was alerted, from Sussex to Cornwall and, to, and finally to the dark forest of Wales. There lived a certain gentle knight by the name of Sir Ector Bon Mason with his two sons. The elder was a handsome, robust youth recently knighted and now known by Sir Kay. The younger was a gentle blonde lad of about 16 whom, whom Sir Ector and his wife had adopted as an infant. His name was Arthur. Although Arthur was not of his blood, Sir Ector loved both his sons equally and devoted himself to their upbringing. Now on the page, top of page 798. Sir Kay was the first to hear the news of the great events in London, for as, as usual, he was in the courtyard polishing his helmet when the messenger arrived. A tournament, at last a tournament, he shouted. We must set out for London at once. Father, you know what this means to me. Yes, son, I do, said Sir Ector, bringing a, the weary messenger a bowl of food. I was young and hot-blooded once too, and eager to show the world my worthiness of knighthood. But this sword-pulling contest, do you wish to be king as well? He asked Kay with a smile. I make no pretense about that, sir. To prove myself on the field of battle is my dream. Please remember that, my son, said Sir Ector. Pursuing one's goal with integrity is all that matters. Integrity me here means honesty and uprightness. No ma now go find off Arthur so that we may prepare to leave. London is a long way off. Arthur had wandered off alone, as he often did after finishing his chores. He was as devoted as ever to being a good squire for his brother. But after all, Kay was Sir Kay now, and he rarely had anything to say his younger brother to his younger brother except to bark orders at him. Arthur didn't mind, though. He was happy just to watch Kay practice his jousting and to dream of someday riding beside him in battle. In the meantime, he had to content himself with his other companions, Lionel and Jasper, his dogs, Cosmo, his falcon, and an orphaned fox cubs he kept hidden in the hollow log, and the deer that came to the edge of the wood when he whis whistled. He was, now in the wo he was in the woods now, patiently holding out a handful of oats for the deer, when Kay came bounding through the meadows to find him. Arthur, come quickly, he shouted. We're leaving for London at once. There's a big tournament. Here's your chance to show me what a good squire you can be. Hurry. Arthur stood silently for a moment. He has never been more than a few miles from his home. Was he daydreaming, or was he really going to London to help Sir Kay bring honor and glory to their family as the whole world looked on? He ran back home, doubting his own ears, until he reached the courtyard and saw Sir Ector preparing the horses for the journey. All of Britain seemed to be making its way to London town that Christmas. Kings and dukes, earls and barons, count and countesses funneled into the city gates for the great contest. Sir Ector was pleased to see his old friends and fellow knights. Sir Kay was eager to register for the jousting, and Arthur was simply dazzled by it all. As Sir Ector and his sons made their way through the city streets, a glint of sunlight on steel caught Arthur's eyes. How odd, he thought. A sword thrust 
point first into the anvil on top of a block of marble sitting in a churchyard surrounded by guards, London is so full of wonders. Dawn arrived with a blare of trumpets calling all contestants to the tournament. In Sir Ector's tent, Arthur buckled the chain mail onto Sir Kay and slipped the tunic of the von Mason colors over his brother's head. We are on the top of page 799. Sir Ector stood and watched until the preparation was complete and his son stood before him in all his knightly glory. Silently, they embraced, mounted their horses, and headed for the tournament grounds. The stadium was the event of the stadium for the event was the grandest ever built. Never had there been such a huge congregation of lords and ladies in the history of England. Congregation here means gathering. The stands surrounded the great meadow, swept clean of all snow, with the combatants' tent at the ends. In the central place of honor sat the archbishop. Patiently he greeted each king and noble as they came forth to kiss his hand. I should do this more often, he chuckled to himself. The first event was the mock battle or melee. The contestants were divided into two teams, the reds and the greens. Sir Kay was with the reds who gathered on the southern end of the field while their opponents took to the north. They all readied their lances and brought down their helmets, visors in anticipation of combat. Everyone looked to the archbishop for the signal. Slowly, he raised his handkerchief, paused, and let it flutter to the ground. From either end of the field, the thunder of thousands of horses' hooves rolled forward, shaking the earth, rattling the stands louder and louder, until a terrifying crash of metal split the air. A shower of splintered lances rained down in all directions. The audience gasped. A few ladies fainted. Nothing had prepared them for this scale of violence. Sir Kay performed admirably, for he charged ahead, of his teammates and unseated two of the greens. He was already winning accolades as he wheeled his charger around to aid a fellow red. As the teams withdrew, they revealed a battleground strewn with fallen warriors, some struggling to rise above, under the weight of their armor, others lying ominously still. Bits and pieces of armor and broken lances littered the field. Now we will begin video two, part two on page 800. Thanks guys.